Hi everyone and welcome to the latest edition of In the Fox's Den and uh, I've got my old boss with me today, um, Steve Powell, who not only started uh, All Sport and then sold the company to Getty Images, but he's also one of the greatest and most well-known sports photographers uh, of our time. And uh, he's now written a book called The Image Business, and he's here to talk about it and to talk about his life as well. So let me introduce to you, Steve Powell. Hi, Steve. How's things? Fine, Rick. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, weird times for everybody, but uh, it's good to see you again. Um, this is a new uh, experience for me because this is the first time I've actually interviewed my old boss. So uh, this is this is terrifying, Steve. Um, this is not what I'm used to at all, but it's uh, but it's great because um, we worked together for for a long, long time, and uh, I'm here really because of you. So uh, I I've got a big thank you to you. So um, when you first started, um, you were brought up in Kenya, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. I spent. Uh... The early years, formative years of my life in Kenya. Um, my father was military, um, but uh, moved back in my early, well, I moved back around 10 years old. Unable to read or write, which didn't help, but uh, <laughs> it got me into a school that taught me how. <laughs> well, you've certainly come a long way now. You've got your own book, so uh, I think that, uh, that shows uh, how far you've come. Um, but you got interested in photography, but it wasn't sport photo photography at first, was it? Because you were you were looking at the photography of people like Don McCullen and Larry Burroughs, and and that was very much the the, the war photography, I guess. Yeah, in my early teens, uh, I was at school in Scotland at boarding school. Um, I was very interested. I've always been interested in news and news reportage, and I was as a young man, you know. The Vietnam War was a big, big influence on all of us. And the work of the likes of Larry Burroughs and, and Don McCullough um, was always in the Sunday papers and everything, in the Sunday magazines. And um, it, it influenced me significantly. And that's really um, what I liked. I liked the reportage side of things. Yeah. I was a really good science master there, a very uh, inspirational guy called Ben Patterson who ran the photography club. So I learned a little bit about photography very early and combined, combined the two interests. Uh, my goal always was to go into photojournalism. And initial, initially it was more to do with, you know, war photography. But how did you get into sport photography then? Was that meeting Tony Duffy? Uh, Tony definitely played a major influence, in, yes. Um, I, I, I was working at Keystone Press Agency, which was one of the old great agencies. Yeah. Had everything, you know. And it, it was my, you know, planned uh, uh, ladder towards my goals, etc. And I, I did some uh, junior photography work, then I went freelance. And I was, um, I did some stuff in Northern Ireland and various others, but the world changed at the time. Vietnam War came to an end. Things weren't quite the same. And um, I met Tony Duffy. And then I started working for him in, in the dark rooms in the early days. And uh, slowly but surely, I drifted into sport. I mean, it, it's fair to say anybody and everybody who knows me, I'm not a sports fan. I don't, you know, I enjoy playing, but I don't particularly watch sports. So with Tony, who was, extreme sports fan um in the end it worked out very well for us but uh, yes it was almost by accident well i think i think a lot of people are going to find that incredible steve because you're now one of the the most renowned sports photographers and uh, certainly one of the best sports photographers in in the world and you started uh, up all sports so to hear uh, that you're not a great sports fan is going to be a massive surprise to a lot of people. Have you got more interested in sport because of this, or has it actually turned you off a bit? Um, well, in the early days, I, when I joined Tony and Don Morley and John Starr, uh, the four of us essentially started up at Ball Sport, um, 
yes, I, I was essentially the, I was, that time I was dark room and then I became sales and marketing. Um, and then I became a photographer, but it was always the goal to be a photographer. Um, but interest in sport, yes, of course, you know, because it was an area that I was involved with, but my interest was more in, you know, telling the story of what was yeah. happening. And, you know, that's the element that really excited me. If I could tell the story of what was happening and seeing people um, at the edge of the human experience, which sport, and I, tragically, war as well does. Yeah. Um, it's those stories and that, that excited me in the early days and still do. So, so did you regularly buy a picture post? Oh yeah, um, at oh, the yeah. time, which yeah. uh, uh, Times Color Second was my favourite, you know, and the Observer. They all used to run fabulous reportage. So I bet you didn't realise it at the time, and obviously we'll come to the whole Getty Images thing later. That, uh, that eventually that whole picture post archive. Um, would go to uh, to a company that you were associated with? Well, many, many years later, as you know, I ended up as um, head of the uh, Getty Source, which was the editorial division. Yeah. And um, my old pictures from Keystone Press Agency were in the files. Brilliant. Yeah. You can't ask for more than that, can you? So what was uh, your first paid assignment then? Was that at Keystone? Um, no, the Keystone assignments, I did uh, the first one, very first one. Um, I hate to admit it, but uh, I forged a, a press pass request on, on a piece of Keystone letterhead paper. <laughs> and flew into that's the, that's the Steve Powell I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> flew into Belfast, and uh, walked into the no-go area in Londonderry and uh, got lifted off the streets by three very heavily armed men in hoods and asked what the hell I was doing there. I explained quietly uh, that I had this letter, sir, and eventually they gave me a provisional IRA press pass. Wow. Uh, so that was my first real assignment, but it was all with my holiday money. Um, and um, I really, until all sport, um, everything I did was, was freelance. I freelanced, uh, it's not in the book, and I wonder why. I used to do rock tours, I freelanced with um, Keith Bartley Band, Ginger Baker, uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, I did lo loads of great bands. Well, when you come to do your second book, uh, yeah. after this one becomes a bestseller, there, there you are, you've got, uh, you've got the content for it. So, uh, so how long were you actually working as a freelance photographer before the whole all sport idea started? Um, it was only a, a few years because I left school around 1969 and really started with Tony and John Starr in 1972, but I was with the boy being the operative word. Um, and then I had a period uh, through uh, extreme hard work, and I blame them, uh, where I had a, a bit of a breakdown and I had to leave the business for a while because I was quite ill. But I came back in 75, and that's when we really started, four of us got together and started to get serious about uh, all sport. And at that point, I was charged as the marketing and sales director, not director, but manager. Well, uh, this, this is a thing I, I think that um, any photographers watching, watching this, and I love them all dearly, of course, because I spent so much time working with them. But uh, I think they'd be the first to say that quite a few of them, not all of them, but quite a few of them haven't actually got business brains. They're very creative, but um, they don't necessarily understand the business side of it. But interestingly, you had both. You were incredibly creative in terms of being a photographer, but you also had the business acumen to to get all sports started to work with people uh, that, that got all sports started with you obviously um and um uh then it became the largest photo uh, sports photographic agency in the world so you must be very proud of yourself for, for doing that steve uh yes very proud but it really was more a question of being self-taught um on the job as it was happening and i think 
I had one major asset in that for some reason, uh, I was able to create environments that uh, good creative people could work in and feel comfortable in. And I like to think the fact that I was quite a reasonable photographer at the time um, also played a role in the sense that although I was very much driving in terms of the business, um, I feel that people understood that I understood the photographer's issues were and what the problems were and how he needed to try and overcome them. So it was, the co it was a, a combination of the business and the photography for sure. Um, how it arrived, I do not know. <laughs> but you, but you, so you... It just was, you know, uh, as anybody who worked with me at the time will know, a lot of hard work and a lot of late nights and a lot of planning. Well, you, you mentioned just before that, that it, it played a, um, a, put a great strain on, on your mental health. And so your family must have been really important to you during that time. Yes, at the time, um, this was before I was married to Deans at first, uh, and it, uh, tragically it happened again. So it's something I'm really comfortable talking about because I think it's important for people to understand that um, you know handling pressure at work we all do it all the time and mm -hmm. it's, you know handling pressure at work and at home is a problem and that's what happened to me i had i had problems at home not with beans it was before i was married to beans um and you know extreme pressures at work and they get to you and they got to me but i recovered and you know took a, a long view on it, and it so it worked how, how do you feel that, that, that you got through that? Was it, obviously, with, with Beans, I know, I know Beans, she's absolutely wonderful. There's no, no way that, uh, that you could be depressed with Beans around. But, um, but uh, was it also throwing yourself into the work that, that, that really helped? Bizarrely, when I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to full transparency here, I had, essentially, I had two nervous breakdowns. Right. One, the first one was a, a serious one. The second was milder. The first one, I didn't know beans. It was before beans and it was to do with a girlfriend and we all have those issues. And it was my parents. It really was my parents uh, helped me through that. Um, but then um, when I got back to work with Tony, I found I couldn't actually pick up the camera because of the, and it took me about three years to get back. So. That's why I was doing sales and marketing. And that skill I had acquired from selling initial towels, a hygiene consultant for two years. <laughs> okay, I'll see you doing that. Uh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> that's but yeah, that's, that's, that's not you, is it really? So look, eventually uh, you, you, you started these conversations to start up All Sport, and it was with Tony Duffy and and John Starr, and uh, and who else was, was, was involved at that time? Don Morley. And Don Morley, of course, yes. Don Morley. And, yes. uh, and we're gonna be putting photographs up on, on, this, uh, uh, on this interview um, that's on our YouTube channel. And one of those, uh, I think, is a picture of the four of you looking rather like a, a very early take that. So, um, so we're, we'll definitely put that up there. So, so these conversations happened, and just take us through a, a little bit of that time that you were forming Allsport, because I spent 17 and a half years working for you at Allsport and with Getty Images, so it was a big part of my life as well. Yeah. Um, yes, the, the early days were very difficult, uh, challenging. Um, we were very fortunate that Don Morley was uh, chief photographer at Sports World magazine, and Sports World magazine went uh, unfortunately bankrupt, but we managed to acquire all of their old, old archives and Don joined us in the process. Basically Don had first rights in I think. And uh, they ended up forming the backbone of the agency. And at that point we had then, John was doing a lot of studio work and, uh, and, and the likes. Uh, Tony was rushing around doing his sports photography and so was Don. Uh, primarily um, motorsports, motorbikes, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I was essentially there visiting publishers, book publishers, magazines, anybody who would buy a photo, trying to sell the idea that we should, you know. <laughs> yeah. It became very obvious very quickly that the backbone of that Sports World Library, on top of all the images that we were producing, was starting to make a very good archive. I remember that Sports World. I, I used to buy it religiously, mm -hmm. um, and I never quite understood stood why it folded because it was a really good magazine yeah well i think if you look at the history of the last 30 40 years or whatever there isn't a sports magazine in the country that survived that long no it's uh, that's that's probably very true sadly um so um so all sport started and uh, and you you started off because when i when i came to join you which was uh, back in 1996 during the Atlanta Olympics. Um, yeah. I think that was probably the second or third venue that uh, that the all sport was working out of because that was in in Collier's Wood. But where did you start off? It was a much much smaller. Yeah, it was then, wasn't it? Very much humbler. It was a very large room behind an insurance brokerage in West Croydon. <laughs> And a dear old friend who was our landlord, Nicholas Paul, uh, used to look after us. We were supposed to have three months rent free if we cleaned it out for him, but it ended up three years, I think, because we could never afford the rent. Um, but we were there for two to three years, I believe, and uh, it worked out there as a good venue. But then we moved to Morden. Yeah. And, you know, every step is a step up larger premises, bigger studios, bigger library. At that point, we started getting the likes of Lee Martin joining us, um, Steve Rose, the late Steve Rose, um, and Robert McMahon. We were getting some very young, keen, enthusiastic guys coming on board and they're starting to organize things. And it slowly but surely proceeded from there. Well, I, I joined uh, when it was quite a large organisation, of course, and Lee Martin was my um, my immediate boss for, um, well, it ended up for 17 and a half years. I couldn't get rid of him, um, even when I was at Getty Images. So, um, so a lot of the people, what's nice to see is a lot of the people that were with the original All Sport and the photographers uh, as well, of course, these great photographers that you had just carried on and some of them are, are, are still at Getty Images today. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that gives me enormous pride and pleasure that um, we managed to transition into Getty and the vast majority of the staff and the senior personnel yeah. and directors stayed on and became important players in Getty Images. It's a huge source of pride. Yeah, no, I can, uh, I can imagine that. And when when I started uh, back in 1996, and I'd been a graphic designer before that, so I was very wet behind the ears and all that sales work you were doing with publishers, I ended up doing, Steve. Um, so um, uh, I started um, and only half the staff were there because the other half were in Atlanta. So it was like four weeks till I actually met any of the rest of, of the staff, but certainly, it gave me my first indication that what was really important to all sport were those Olympic Games and the work that, that uh, you and we were doing with the, the IOC. And they played a really important part in, in your development personally, haven't they? The, the, the Olympic Games uh, was huge for us, huge and always had been, even before we uh, had become the official photographers for the Olympics. Um, I, you know, we managed to achieve a great deal with the IOC and the games and our relationship obviously with Michael Payne at the time uh, was very solid and it was a great, great moment for us when we got those. It opened up, you know, the ability for us to send multiple photographers and technicians to a games on along the same kind of lines that, you know, a, you know AFP could, Reuters could. Uh, AP could, we could never get those numbers prior to that contract and that agreement. Uh, that put us on a competitive footing with the rest of the um, industry, basically. 
uh, we just came in it at it from a different direction because there was no way that we were going to be allowed in through the more traditional routes of uh, media accreditation. But but it was actually remarkable, you know, when you talk about how all sports started off, and the people that you handpicked that you that you handpicked that are still, you know, a lot of them are still there today, and that they were all the right people because they were the people to bring all of this about and 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 to grow it to the point where Getty Images really wanted it. So. So it's a remarkable story, and a lot of that is is in your book, which I have here. So uh, everyone can see. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give that a, we'll we'll give that more of a plug later on in the in, in the interview. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, Steve, was um, when I when I came in, there was a, a real transition going on because when I first started at, at All Sport. Um, the photographers used to come in every day with their film and uh, and go down into into the dark room and uh, then we had dark room staff down there and then I won't say that it happened overnight but there was a very quick transition into digital and it was great to be part of of that uh, in those sort of late 90s, early 2000s, where Allsport, I think, were probably amongst the, the, the first to recognise that, um, that that transition was, was happening. And suddenly everything was Canon and Nikon digital photography. How did you find that, that tradition, uh, that transition per personally? Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you think it was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Relatively quick. Oh, it was a long, hard haul. Yeah. Um, I mean, genuinely, we, we started involving ourselves or the computers, etc., probably earlier than most of the industry. Um, but it was because we already had um, uh, within the, the agency a kind of a sense that computers are powerful tools that could help us, etc., and that, if I can say with some modesty, was very much my driving force because. I loved them, you know, I, I, I'd sit there and do programming and find ways of doing jobs with the computer, you know. So when digital photography came along, not the pre the cameras, pre the, but the scanning and all the rest of it, for us to be competitive, I really wanted us to be selling pictures into the newspapers and live pictures. And we'd managed through uh, Eddie Shah and today when they, turned colour, we managed to get ourselves in there and uh, as the newspaper industry slowly turned colour, we became a, a very dominant player in the newspaper industry and we had to go wire servicing. But the traditional and the old analogue wire service was not something that we were going to invest in. So we started looking at um, the Hasselblad digital scanners and various others and uh, actually as if the story in the book tells how it was that uh, it was Agency France Press that actually turned me on to that because they were complaining about something all sport had done at the Olympics. And I once went into their offices to apologize and I saw two prototype scanners sitting on their desk. <laughs> and I managed to convince them to give Thanks. me a <laughs> And I went back and within two weeks or a couple of months, I think we had, a, we had two sitting in our office in London. Yeah how it worked and that was I believe um, prior to the Seoul Olympics in 88. Yeah well that was obviously um, before my time so it was it was it was all but I, I just remember spending time going up the ladders and, and finding 35 millimeter transparencies in the in in about 2000 filing cabinets um, which I believe now are over at the Getty Images archive, once called the Horton archive. So they they still exist. And uh, but but certainly, you know, looking looking through um, looking through a loop at thirty five millimeter transparencies um, on a light box in a in a in an office that had no windows was uh, something I'll remember forever, Steve. Well, I think those. Filing cabinets are now being poured all over by Daryl Ingham. I hope he is, anyhow. 
because dear old Daryl is up there and I've, I've seen pictures of him in his, his khaki jacket or coat. <laughs> well, Daryl... Daryl will be very happy to get a mention in this interview and make sure that, that, that it gets sent to him. So, look, you, Allsport became the largest sports photographic agency in the world. I think it's fair to say that prior to Allsport, a lot of the sports photography had been done by the newspapers themselves. The, 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 the agencies weren't really happening until Allsport, and then suddenly other agencies set up but none of them as big as all sport so it was obvious then that when getty images um were looking to have sports content that they would come to you so how did those initial talks come about and 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 who instigated them was that mark getty or was that yourself uh no it was mark getty and um I mean, everyone knew at the time. I mean, the, the whole industry was aware of what was happening, that Getty and Corbis with Bill Gates and others were in the industry looking around at sports, no, not just sports, but all kinds of photo agencies. Um, Tony Stone Agency was the first to go to Getty. Um, the industry was definitely talking about it. It was there at all the time. And Adrian and I got a phone call from uh, Mark Getty, I think. This, this, this is Adrian Morell. Oh, uh, and we had lunch uh, with Jonathan Klein and, Ad and Mark Getty. Uh, the next time, I was based in LA at the time, so we had lunch and talked. And I said to them that we're, we're not even close to interested. You know, go away, come back in a year or two, and we'll let you know. Um, went away talked with the others and said, right, now we have to start getting ourselves ready. And of course, we couldn't do that uh, with uh, all of our honorable staff knowing, because you can't do it like that. So we spent quite a long time, for you, uh, well, a year or more, two, whatever, preparing this whole idea and this whole, uh, preparing the company to be looked at by multiple buyers without being able to tell anybody, which was quite a challenge, but it worked. Did uh, did they ever have anyone else in mind other than all sport, or was it always, did it have to be all sport for them? I think in terms of sports photo agencies, as far as I'm aware, and I wouldn't like to hit the bank on it, but there, they were in the in the mode at the time of, you know, best of class buying. They only wanted the yeah. best in each sector. And there was no question at the time who was the best in the industry. And we had, as we were so advanced at the time, on by that time, digitally, and we were actually doing, we had our own uh, archive, online archive, which was almost unheard of at the time. And Getty looked at that and realized it was somewhat in advance of their own at the time and the work they'd been doing. So yes, there was no question they wanted us and um, there were other offers but in the end for us as well it was the best offer yeah no I am um, I'm very glad you did as I say I spent 17 and a half years with uh, from from all sport to Getty Images and um, and I'm where I am now because of that so well, I'm very grateful one of the interesting things that hindsight gives you is um, if you look at the other bidders that we had at the time, which was essentially Corbis and Bill Gates, um, Reuters obviously still a very uh, powerful organization, but there were several others. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, Getty are the only one that survived. I think they represent all the others now. <laughs> I think they, I think they do. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's become quite a big business, I would say. Um, I think Mark's happy with it. Um, so then you made the what must have been a difficult decision to to leave the business. What what brought that about, Steve? Because uh, I think the rest of us thought you were going to be around for quite a while. It wasn't a difficult decision, Rick. Um, again, any of the guys that worked with me closely over those those years knew that I didn't want to be hanging around. 
you know, I had really good people at the helm. I had Adrian Morell, Lee Martin, uh, David Cannon. There was lots of other uh, guys, all at middle management style. They were all really good people. And to have, I, I stayed with Getty for a year or two integrating, but as I looked around, I realized that it, they didn't need the old guy who, you know, used to be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I do know uh, about you, Steve, and I'm sure that nothing has changed, is that you are incredibly entrepreneurial. And uh, and I go back to the days when I think it was me that introduced you to sport business, and then suddenly you became part of that because they were my client, and then suddenly the, you were uh, you, you were running it. Um, so I know that that you do love new projects and uh, and to get yourselves in, involved in things so i can't imagine that retirement meant retirement so what happened when you left getty images because i know there must have been loads more projects you got involved in yeah, there was a number of things in play and and it, it would be disingenuous to say that i didn't have a period of uh, time when i wasn't quite sure which direction i was going i was enjoying life but uh, not too many uh, clear plans. Uh, and yes, the sports business thing was uh, um, an interesting project, which uh, unfortunately in the middle of it, I had a horse riding accident and broke my back, which was I remember that. Quite, a, quite a moment. Uh, and I was very lucky. And I, you know, after some, quite a few months, I was able to get back up and recover. Um, but in the process, it, I realized that if I was going back into business, it would be for money. And not, not a bad reason. Yeah, it's a good reason, but it wasn't a reason that I wanted to do it for money. And you know, again, people who knew me at the time, motivate my motivation was totally different. So I decided that I was going to retire full time and uh take projects which i did in, in in all seriousness um the um the industry that that we work in and the industry that i still work in it takes passion yeah um and uh, and you've got to love it because it becomes part of your social a big part of your social life Absolutely. um as well as your business life so uh, i know that you were in, incredibly passionate about it and, and that's a passion that that I still share to to this day, Steve. So uh, I do un I do understand it's not just about the money. If it was just if it was just about the money, I wouldn't be doing this still. Um, so uh, so yeah, I I completely understand that. Now um, uh, on a personal level, when you're talking about the uh, the things that you did, um, I do know that you built a boat and you sailed uh, to Antarctica. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Uh, I had a boat built slightly. Yes. I didn't personally build it, but I spent <laughs> a year virtually full time working on the plans and working on the specs and working with the builders um, and took delivery in early 2008 and spent the summer in the, the Solent learning how to sail the thing. <laughs> and then set off and crossing the channel over to france was my first crossing of a major sea <laughs> um, uh, but then i eventually ended up down going patagonia down into to antarctica and that was always the plan and um, we ended up spending living virtually full time for seven years on that boat seven years I, I didn't realize it was that long. So when did you get time to um, to work on this Royal Hunting Lodge? Because this was another one of your projects. See, I know you've got loads of projects. Well, that happened pretty much straight away from when I uh, retired from uh, Getty Images. Uh, I bought it early 2000 and I spent three years restoring it. And it was a fabulous project. I really enjoyed it. I mean, it was just great fun. Um, you know, involved a few sleepless nights, anything good does. Yeah. And um, I finished that just in time to break my back the following year. So that- As you do. As you do. Yeah. Um, after recovering from the broken back, I started racing small uh, RSLE, small race boats, sailing boats. 
And that's what got me into the uh, bigger picture of the bigger boat and doing a bit more exotic things. Uh, well, you, but you've always done exotic things, Steve, haven't you? Because you did the Cresta run years ago. Because I, re I remember those pictures of you doing the Cresta run being in the Augsburg Library. Yeah, that's true. That is true. <laughs> yeah. So, you're, you're so, so, uh, so you've always done that, and and something tells me that you you're not gonna you're not gonna stop now. So let let's come to the, to this book um, because um, this is a, a really great book, maybe the the first uh, of its kind with someone um, of your stature actually writing about the the image business, which is the the, the title of the book. So, when did you first decide? to to write a book and how did you decide what what to put in it and 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 who did you work with in terms of in terms of putting it together all good questions um i didn't actually decide to write the book uh back in 2013 john walker who's an old writer journalist friend of mine um i've known him since our early 20s we used to work on powerboat water ski magazine together and uh, he approached me and said, you've got to write this story. You've got to write the story. And I kind of said, oh, I'm kind of busy, John. I've got things going on. And at roughly the same time, I was uh, sailing in the Med, and then I was skiing in Berbier in the winter. And Michael Payne, again, IOC Michael Payne, he, we're having dinner. He's, he just finished a great book, his own book, uh, about the Olympic movement. And he started harassing me. You've got to write the book. You've got to write. So this went on. I dabbled at it a little bit with John back in 2013, but I was too busy on other things. So in 2019, uh, pre-COVID, I hasten to add, uh, John hit me up again and said, look, you're, you're, you're sitting around at home now. What are you going to do? So um, he convinced me that I should. Again, Michael Payne talked to me about it and said, you've got to. Uh, so I said, OK, I'm off for Christmas. I'm going to see some friends in South Africa. I'll start when we get back. And we got back, and of course, I started. And then the COVID pandemic started, <laughs> which was a tragic for a lot of people. But it, boy, did, did, did it give me some time. And there's, there's no, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people where obviously COVID is tragic and something that we never thought that would happen in reality and would only happen in Hollywood. Um, but it, but it has happened, and it's it's amazing how creative a lot of people have have been because they've finally got the time to to do things that they've always wanted to do. So it's uh, yeah, swings and roundabouts. Being able to track and watch projects that people are doing, not just online, not just on, but also local community projects and the way that people have changed how they buy food, how how they source it and how local people have changed how they put it out there on the market yeah. it's a revelation you know and it, but it also you know talks to the fundamental human ability to adapt and grow adapt change and make things work no that's uh, that's incredibly true and you are on a youtube channel that only started because of covid and uh, and now I, be I believe this is the the 20th interview 19th or 20, 20th i think that uh, that we've had on here so it's very fitting yeah. that it um, that it should be my uh, my old boss who was the who was the biggest influence on me to to get here um now uh, a lot of people will know your photographs probably better than they know you because that tends to happen with photographers is you know these great photographs, um, but not necessarily the name of the person that, that, that took it. But there is one photograph which, which we're gonna show um, on, uh, uh, at the end of, the, uh, of this interview, which is that fantastic picture of Maradona taking on quite a few Belgian defenders, which has literally gone viral everywhere and has done for, for many years. So can, um, can you first of all explain a little bit about that particular photograph, but also talk about some of the other great photographs that you're proud of? Uh, that, that photograph, well, yes, it was the opening match 
at the 1982 World Cup in Barcelona. Uh, Argentina versus Belgium. It was an unimportant match. It had no real significance to the overall or the championships. Uh, but every photographer and their uncle wanted to go there because it was the only thing happened. It's the first game. And I was working for Sports Illustrated and I was third man on the roster. I was still a relatively junior guy on the team. And uh, we had Manny Milan and uh, there's a, I think, I, I can't remember, but you know, two other really great, well-known Sports Illustrated photographers. So when we arrived at the stadium, quite rightly, Manny said he'd take one end and you know they split it between them and they told me to go up into the step into the gods somewhere which i duly did and uh, i sat there jumping in between positions of public seats and the like thinking oh, i'll try and do something and um i'm on a 600 with a 1.4 converter and uh, there was a free kick and the wall was there and I should remember who it is. I think I can't remember. I'm not a football fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> I put the ball and the Belgian wall split into a fan shape and looked at him in horror. And as you know from the photo, the Maradona is on his tiptoes and I just one frame. Never thought anything more about it. Maradona passed, passed it on someone else. The game died. It was complete non entity of the game. All the film went back to Sports Illustrated, and as you're well aware, uh, our agreement with Sports Illustrated in, in terms of copyright, and was from the very, very beginning, which incidentally was probably one of the major, major differences that we had all sport to every other agency in the business. We kept copyright on everything. And our deal was that everything they didn't use, they sent back to us. So this came back and I'm editing with the old loop and. Uh, 35 mils, I'm going through it, and I saw this picture, and I thought, oh my God, clipped it out, red plotted it, and thought that'll go well in the previews, you know, and sure enough, it did. The next year, everything that happened, every time Maradona is talked about, that picture goes, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't till many, many years later, 2014, believe it or not, and um, I'm in Malta sailing, and we've just had a very good liquid lunch at the Royal Malta Yacht Club. So, you know, <laughs> and uh, my phone rings, and it was my eldest daughter, Lucy, saying, Dad, watch out, you've gone viral. And I'm going, whoa, whoa, what's that about? And then Sophie, my other daughter, phones, and starts exactly the same. And apparently, on Twitter, there was this whole hoo-ha about the photographer was deceiving the public into suggesting that Maradona had scored a goal. And I thought nothing of it. And I've you know, got loads of calls from all kinds of uh, newspapers and stuff like that. And it was Johnny Weeks, I think from, I think it's the, the Observer. He wrote the best piece on it. And I've used a section of it in the book, explaining that the fact that that picture suggested that thought actually makes the whole thing how, how great it is because it suggests what's going to happen. It was great. And that picture's published everywhere ever since. It, it, because Maradona um, is as revered as, as he is, along with Pelé as being one of the greatest footballers of all time, there are certain photographs that um, you immediately think of with, uh, with, with those players. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's Pelé you know, scoring that, that goal in the World Cup final with his, with his arm up in the air. There's the, the picture of the Golden Bank save. But for Maradona, it's your picture. It's yeah. your picture that's always shown, which sums up the brilliance of Maradona as, as a player. And, um, and when he passed away, I've never seen a picture used as much everywhere as that was to sum up his career in one frame. And what everybody needs to remember is that's pre-digital. Yeah. So you didn't get to have a look at it and then go through a few frames to see what was the best one. You had one chance to get it and you didn't see what was on it until the film was put into the dark room. And it was a very, very different business to the one today. 
uh, and I'm not demeaning any of the photographers around today. They're absolutely fantastic. But the job was a hell of a lot harder when you didn't know what was on the film. I didn't see the film for probably three to four weeks. Because, you know, went to New York, came back. And when I was shooting for Sports Illustrated, which I did a lot, I was traveling all the time. Uh, this is, you know, uh, early 80s. Um, I'd go three or four assignments, sometimes more, without actually seeing any of my films. So not knowing how I'm doing, you know, are my exposures right? Am I getting everything right? It, it was very difficult. And it is very different from today, for sure. Yeah. No <laughs> so coming up to date then, um, and just to, to finish off this, this wonderful interview, which I think everyone's gonna, gonna enjoy because you've given a real insight to, to the industry and, uh, uh, but you've just highlighted it here. So everyone should buy the book to, to find out the rest of the story. But um, what's, um, what are you gonna be doing now, Steve? Are you gonna, be, find yourself a, 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 a an, another boat to, to go around the world on or do another crest a run because uh, one thing I do know is you're not going to be putting your slippers on and smoking a pipe and watching the television so what's uh, what's uh, coming up for Steve Powell? This is the point I disappoint all your audience. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't show me your slippers. <laughs> I'm a grandfather now. I'm very proud. Congratulations. Um, and um, Lucy and, and her husband, Will, uh, and my little grandson, Noah, live in Portland, Oregon. So a lot of our life is trying to arrange how do we get to see each other more often. But um, yes, I think the answer to your question is I determined that I would never play golf until I was old. <laughs> I now play golf. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, can I ask if you have a handicap yet? I do, yes. Um, uh, I'm not playing to it, unfortunately, but it's, it's 21, but it's not that that's, good. That, that's, that's not bad. That's, uh, that, that's pretty good for someone who um, didn't start till they were your age, which I, which I guess now is about 35, Steve. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> so, um, so look, thank you very much for, for this interview. Um, it's been great. You've taught me, even though I worked for you for, for God knows how many years, you've still taught me a lot of things I didn't know about you. Um, and uh, this has been absolutely brilliant. So what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll put up those pictures that we've talked about during this interview and, uh, and uh, everyone should go and buy this book. Um, and um, you can get it on Amazon. Is that right? So always the easiest place, I guess, is, is yeah. to go onto Amazon, put in The Image Business by Steve Powell and, uh, and leave a review as well, because reviews are, are always good. Steve, thank you very much. Love to you and your family, especially Beans, who I know keeps you on the straight and narrow, or has at least tried to keep you on the straight and narrow all of these years. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing you in person again very soon. Thanks a lot, Rick. It's been a real pleasure. Enjoy it's been it. very enjoyable. Take care, Steve. Take it easy. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. It was uh, strange talking to my old boss again. Uh, probably the longest conversation I've ever had with him, to be honest. Um, but it was a real insight into the industry and the importance of the sports photography that we had then and still have today. Because now, of course, all these sports pictures that you see in newspapers and magazines and now on the internet as well. A, a lot of that came from um, those days of, of Steve Powell starting up uh, All Sport when uh, there weren't any other sports agencies around and a lot of people um, copied them. Um, this book tells the story. It's uh, Steve's book, The Image Business. Uh, it is available on Amazon and the link to that is at the bottom of this, uh, this uh, interview. So um, thank you once again for joining uh, Agent Fox Media for the In The Fox's Den. I think this is our 20th interview now. And um, please, please subscribe to the channel. 
um, let's see if we can get over 100 subscribers. I think we're up to 97 at the moment, so we just need three more and hopefully a lot more than that as well. We'll see you next time. Thank you.